And that's why we have this German uh, uh, mathematician who has a master of science in physics and a PhD in math who has been invited in New York to come to this country to speak on this subject. And since he couldn't, or hasn't yet been able to do that, uh, we're, we're going to invite him here right now. <laughs> Ansgar. Well, can you hear Ansgar me? Schneider is, um, he'll be speaking about the collapse of the North Tower and about what can be learned from the physics with NIST's assumption of a progressive floor collapse. Unfortunately, he can't join us, uh, but uh, because our, our, uh, the US authorities have refused his entry uh, into our country, but we have accepted his entry here. Let's give him a big hand. Uh, so uh, good day, everybody. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Okay, very good. Uh, so we, we made a trial for my presentation, but I'm not sure whether actually I, uh, I'm able to repeat that. Uh, so you can't see my presentation. So how do I get that again? Um, go ahead and share that, Ansgar. Share your presentation. Um, so yeah, I will talk about the collapse of the North Tower. Um, you probably uh, have seen it 100,000 times, how the North Tower collapsed. So the North Tower is the two of the twin, one of the twin towers with the uh, with this large antenna on top. Here you see it from the southwest, and here you see it uh, from the northeast. Um, so I'm going to show you a clip, and I want to note that in the beginning, in the first seconds of the clip, you can see the roof line, and then later on you can still see the crushing front. So here you see the roof line, and here you see the uh, Crushing front moving down. So these two observations uh, will be important later. So I will now explain a physical model of what might have happened to this building. Namely, we assume that the collapse of the building followed a progressive floor collapse. And I will try to explain what that means. So here you see a sketch of the building. Um, so these uh, gray uh, horizontal lines, uh, bars here are the four slabs, and you see the uh, columns uh, indicated here. So one story had approximately a height of 3.8 meters. And uh, presentation goes on, oh yeah. So, um, so we assume that there's one story which is uh, so much weakened because of the aircraft impact or because of the fires uh, that it can't stand the weight anymore. So this story collapses. And then the top section impacts this lower floor here. And then the floor below, the story below also collapses and so on and so forth. So we, we assume that this behavior happened to this building. It's an assumption. And uh, you can then describe this physical behavior and analyze the geometry of this. So while the building is collapsing, you have three parts of the building. The top section, which we assume is undestroyed, and the middle section, which is increasing in height as the crushing front moves down and progresses. And then there is this remaining still intact bottom section, which is decreasing in height as the crushing front moves down. So the amount of how much this middle section here is compacted is uh, specified by a numerical parameter, which I call compaction parameter. And you might think of this as approximately 15%. So that means that if the story of uh, well, a certain height, 3.8 meters, uh, that the story is squeezed up to 15% of its original height after the crushing front has passed by. So then we also assume that th this, this top section and this middle section, they move together downward with the same velocity. And having said all this, you can then formulate a mathematical model 
from, from out of this geometry and about from the from the moving mass, which uh, is essentially very simple, as you can see, <laughs> it's uh, it's it's just a formulation of classical Newtonian mechanics. I won't comment further on this right now. You can look it up in the papers if you like. I want to emphasize the following. So this mathematical equation, this is a tool to do something. And what, what I can do with this equation is what I can compute the resistance force of the structure while the building collapses from the movement of the falling section. So once I know the, the movement of the section, I can compute the resistance force. So if the movement is getting faster, then you can conclude that there is little resistance. And if the mo movement is getting slower, then you can conclude that there is a lot of resistance. So what we have to do is we have to investigate the movement of the building. And uh, how we can do that. So here are uh, four stills from a video taken from the north side of uh, uh, the, the, the building. So you see the north side, it's taken from the north at uh, four distinct times. And here you can see I tracked the roof line uh, in this last, in this fourth picture, you see this blue line here, and that is um, keeping track of the antenna. So if the blue line were not here, you could see here the last bit of the antenna before it disappears behind the dust cloud. So you can still uh, determine the position of the roof line, which is here. And so you can evaluate all this, all this and then you get um, certain numbers for the elevation uh, of the roof line. And you can then turn this and couple this with a mathematical model, which I earlier wrote down. And uh, so here you see these horizontal lines these are the measurements which I showed you and in the middle of these lines, which is not like the, the drawn here is the, the actual empirical value. So these are the error bars. So the, the, the roof line is somewhere between these error bars. So this is, uh, this indi the, 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 here you see it indicated the height of the tower top and this is time, of course. So then these colored graphs indicate the movement of the roof line as computed by the physical model. So these are not measured data, these are, the phys these, these are data from the physical model. And it's, it's uh, indicated here for four different upward forces. And uh, I want to emphasize here the red graph, the 250 megajoule solution. So that means an energy of 250 megajoules was dissipated during the construction of a story. So the upward, the average, upward force is this energy divided by the story height. And uh, so a similar result has been obtained by Bajand and others in 2008 already. And what they conclude is that, as you see here, the collapse continues. So they conclude that the, the building's strength, the resistance force of the building was too weak to arrest the collapse as soon as it had started. But this conclusion is false because they miss certain observation, which I show you now. You can, oh, sorry. So you can evaluate the position of the crushing front at later stages. So this right uh, photograph here, this right still is from the video, which I showed you in the very beginning. This still here is from another video, which I didn't show you in the beginning, but you can, trace the crushing front, the movement of the crushing front at these times indicated, 7.7 .7 seconds and 9.25 seconds. And then you have to work a little bit and then you can determine the height of the crushing front, the elevation of a concourse level. And with these data then, you can go back into the, uh, the numerical uh, solution and you find the following diagram. So here you see these three upper error bars are the error bars as I've show, shown you before and here this is again the 250 megajoule solution and you see that these other two empirical values which are the these two bottom horizontal lines uh, that at this time here 7.7 .7 seconds the computed solution from the physical model precedes the empirical value by 40 meters approximately. So this means 
that in the time interval between 4.5 seconds and 7.7 .7 seconds, there was a tremendous deceleration of the top section. So you see this red graph, the curve, the curving of the red graph is towards, is, is downward. And here you see the curving is, uh, so to say, upwards. And this means here, the movement is decelerating. And you can compute how much the movement, uh, how, how, how big the force is that, uh, that, that, that takes place to decelerate the top section so much. So here in this diagram, the computation has been done where I turn on the force here at 4.5 seconds and I stop the force here at 7.7 .7 seconds. But if I would not turn off the force here, then you would find that uh, the fall of the building would actually arrest. So here, there is no downward movement visible anymore in this diagram. So I didn't turn off the force. In the, the talking about the blue graph here in the right diagram. So um, this, this violet graph is not of any importance here, actually, it's just for comparison. So the, the blue graph is uh, the important one. So the sum of these two values here, this uh, 1,700 and 250 is approximately 2,000. And the conclusion here is that if we assume that the building collapsed in a gravity-driven progressive floor collapse, then we can conclude that um, the possible resistance force of the structure was on a scale of 2000 megajoules per story, which is the sum of these two values here in, in this middle interval, in this uh, middle time interval. And uh, we also see that uh, the uh, structure of uh, the resistance force was very far below this possible value in the time interval before and in the time interval after this middle, uh, uh, this middle time interval. So we, we conclude that in these two time intervals, somehow the, the building structure was reduced. And uh, the model doesn't tell you which phenomenon reduced the building, uh, the, the structural force, but I can uh, observe that this was the case. So, Excellent. Um, thank you so much, Ansgar. This yeah. is awesome. Um, I've, do you want to make uh, one closing statement and we'll be able to uh, uh, move on with the, uh, we're, we're getting the news over here. Yeah, so, uh, well, I mean, the, the conclusion is, um, we, we have to find this unknown phenomenon, which could possibly could have possibly reduced the structural force, uh, the, the resistance force, and uh, to my knowledge, there's only one explanation that is active human intervention. So, um, <laughs> very well put. That was that was polite. Gail, could you uh, hold up the DVD that shows active human intervention uh, at the twin towers? Uh, any one of them. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, sources there for you. Ansgar, a big hand for Ansgar. Thank you so much. Awesome. Now, Ansgar has been invited uh, by the International Association of Bridge and Structural Engineering to give this paper. They accepted him, and yet he couldn't get into the country. He's hoping still, aren't you, Ansgar, to give this presentation uh, by Skype to the uh, association this week? Or next week. Yeah, it was uh, so the, this uh, slightly um, different version of this presentation was shown at the conference. So uh, oh, it on was Thursday. fantastic. On how, Thursday, how was yeah. it received? Well, I don't know because it was. I mean, it was a record of presentation, and uh, so I didn't. <laughs> I didn't have any contact with the audience, but it was shown in uh, uh, in my session. Fantastic! It's, Thanks so much again, Ansgar. Big hand. <laughs> All right. Going to jump back now, uh, and um, that was Ansgar Schneider. And guess what? The evidence shows on the table, 9-11 uh, explosive evidence experts speak out all 10 key characteristic and uncharacteristic features of controlled demolition. And so these are the, uh, the resources that you have over here so that we can get to the bottom uh, of the truth about what happened on 9-11, what really happened. Thank you very much.
Thank, thank you, Richard Gage.